Hello everybody. This time around, we're gonna be talking about some of the basics of print design. We're really just going to skim the fundamentals of print design. We're not uh, getting in deep into design concepts or elements of art or principles of de design or anything like that. We're not gonna talk about things that'll make you a good designer. These are just some kind of an overview of the things that will help you not send broken files to the printer. <laughs> so that's our goal here today. Um, if you want to learn design principles, there are definitely other classes that get into that a lot more than this one. So a couple of things. This is a summary or a survey of just a few topics real quick as a refresher partly and also introduction to some new things. A spot color, as you know, is an ink that's mixed up using special pigments. Um, it's separate from the CMYK color separations that you normally use to print a photo or, or some other printed document. The reason for that is that you just simply cannot recreate every single possible color that's out there using just cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Those pigments have deficiencies that make it so that you just can't reproduce some of the same colors that you could if you specially mixed a color using specific pigments and, and inks or colors for, uh, for that specific color value. So um, Pantone is a company, for example, that uh, produces and sells a, a formula a matching system that allows you to build a whole bunch of colors, 1600 something different colors of ink using their own formulas of, of dyes or pigments. So let's say that we wanted to print ASU gold and ASU maroon. There are specific Pantone colors for those. Uh, typically when those are printed, uh, here at the university, we don't use uh, a mixture of cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Instead, we'll use a single spot color so that when it runs through the press, there's a single dedicated ink for maroon and a single dedicated ink for yellow. And it's going to be specific to ASU's colors and it's going to give us more consistency. It's going to reduce cost because it, we print a lot of maroon and gold here. And if we were using four color bills to do that that's four times as many hits on the on the inks as if we're just doing that one time for each of those spot colors so it's more efficient more uh, cost effective for us and it gives us more um, consistency and reliability that we're getting the accurate colors and the right colors across different substrates and things like that rich black is another thing to consider in design I don't know that the graphic shows uh, terribly well on this recording. So if it doesn't, I just have to take my word for it. But you can also open up Photoshop or InDesign or Illustrator and experiment with this too. Basically, if you're going to print black ink on paper, some of the paper is still going to show through. That black ink is not dense enough, not rich enough to look like anything but really dark gray. And sometimes that works just fine when it's all by itself. You're not going to notice it. But when it's next to other blacks or other colors, it might look a little washed out and faded. And so the solution is to print with something called rich black. Now on the screen here, this is kind of a standard value. If you don't know what specific values to use for rich black, 50% cyan ink, 40% magenta, 40% yellow, and then hundred percent black with all four of those colors or ink values laid on top of each other. The printed page is going to be a very dense, rich black look. So that's the solution to the deficiency of that single black ink going down on the paper that leaves it looking pretty gray and, and washed out. Those values though, 50, 40, 40, 100, those are uh, generalizations. It, it's, it's a good idea to sp talk to your print provider and find out the specific rich black values that they want to use. They might have a different value for using coded and uncoded stocks, or they might have different values for if they're running on a digital press versus an offset press or whatever else. So Again, communication is important. As you read through that Prisma Graphics uh, uh, guide for setting up a successful print, you'll see that their rich black values don't include any yellow at all. Um, and they're able to reproduce rich black using just cyan, magenta, and black. So communicate with the print facility. Print service provider will know exactly what to use for their equipment. All right. So far, we're just kind of talking about things that, that beginning designers tend to, to make mistakes on. And bleed is, is definitely one of those that always comes up and you want to watch for it. If you get bleed right, it'll make you look a lot better than if you get it wrong. That's for sure. The concept of bleed is simple. On a, on a large digital printing press or offset press or gravier or whatever, the edges of the paper don't get printed. On a sheet fed press, the front edge or the top of the page is going to be pulled through on a gripper. 
um, on the edges of the paper in lots of presses. There's going to be markings for color management and, and other things, registration. And, and so that's not usable printing area. So the sheet of paper that goes through the press is going to have some white borders around it. Your printed image isn't going to extend all the way to the edge of the paper like you would get on a photo that you get printed at uh, Walgreens or something like that. So there's no edge to edge printing in most types of uh, commercial printing. The solution to that one is pretty simple. In our design, we're going to design with a bleed area in mind. So the bleed area is going to extend beyond where we want the finished page to end. So in this example on the right hand side, you see that uh, there's the green dashed line. Everything outside of that green line is going to get trimmed off in the end. And so the result is that it looks like it's printed from the edge to the edge of the printed page. So for example, if we're doing an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, it's going to have an eighth to a 16th inch of extra printed area all around the entire edges of that page. Once it prints, it's going to all get trimmed off and there'll be no white border left anymore. But if you were to design your document so that your, your printed area went right up to that trim line, the bleed area, then the problem is that when things shift around and get trimmed, it's not going to necessarily get every single sheet of that page perfectly lined up. As you can see in this, this uh, little video, the giant stack of paper gets trimmed all at once. These cutters are pretty impressive to watch and use. But sometimes there's a sheet that's out of order there. And you see down there close to the bottom, there's a couple of pages that are sticking out a little bit. If you tried to set your design up so that the printed edge of your document went exactly to that trim line, chances are you're going to have a little bit of a white border on one side of the page, a little hairline that's going to look really bad and, uh, and not be a professional looking printed piece. So you want to avoid that by using proper settings for bleed. It gives you a margin of error and, uh, Going back to the previous slide, having a margin or a safe area uh, will prevent errors in the other direction. You definitely don't want to have that little white hairline, but you don't want to have important elements of your design clipped off or cut off in trimming as well. So the amount of bleed that you use is going to vary from one print shop to the next, depending on how tight the tolerances are, how fast they work, what kind of equipment and, and all sorts of things, and just how safe they want to be typically. Um, the print lab here at campus is going to ask you to use a 1 16th of an inch or 0 0.0625 inches bleed around your document. So in your assignment this week, it's going to ask you to use that for your bleed settings. But some places they'll use an eighth of an inch, uh, 0.125, or uh, if somebody's cutting it out with scissors, maybe <laughs> you might use a quarter of an inch bleed. Uh, anyway, the idea is that you just give yourself that little bit of leeway so that you can have a nice printed document that goes from edge to edge. All right. So, um, from your reading material this week, um, and the activities there, you should be learning a little bit about InDesign and its role in the print process. So InDesign is a program made by Adobe. It's a layout program for creating designs and prepping them for print. Uh, it's, it, unique to Adobe because it, it does things that some of the other programs don't do. You can create graphics in it, sort of, but it's not made for creating graphics. It's made for assembling your images and your text and your graphics into a finished piece. So we take our photo, we take our, uh, our vector art, we take our text, our headlines, everything, and we assemble them. We create our layout in InDesign. And so kind of the thing to remember is that InDesign isn't really creating and holding your stuff there. It's more like a folder where you're, imagine you cut out all these clippings of photos and text and everything, and you put them in a manila folder, and then you're going to take that folder to the print shop and have them produce your document based on your, your assets. InDesign is like that folder. It's going to hold all your stuff, but it is the InDesign file isn't your stuff. It's just the container for it. So when you export out of InDesign, what that does is it takes whatever's on your screen in your layout, and it's going to make that into a new document, a PDF, ideally, that's going to spit out with all your content. Now, there are different flavors of PDF, and by flavors, I just mean presets or standards. So in InDesign, you choose File, Export, and then you can choose the PDF preset after you've chosen a name and a location to save your document. Um, and the PDF X just means that it's a standard that's accepted for printing. It's graphics exchange standard. So there are others like smallest file or uh, print ready and stuff like that. 
But uh, the one we want to be concerned with is the PDF-X-1A standard. That's going to be the safest standard for you to use for commercial printing applications because it embeds the fonts. It's going to specify the marks and bleeds that are necessary for you to get your document trimmed out properly. It's going to ensure that your colors are all CMYK colors and or spot colors. And it's going to flatten transparency. So these are important things to be aware of so that you don't run into issues um, at the press and expensive delays or uh, reworks of your file. So um, always use X1A if you're unsure, uh, but some print facilities, they may accept other standards. So again, it's just one of those things where you're going to want to communicate with the print shop that you're working with. On the other hand, um, rather than sending out a flat file, sometimes it's, it's better to send the print shop your InDesign file. And as you can see by these really outdated and old memes, those are the best kind, that one does not simply send an InDesign file. Like I told you before, an InDesign file is more just a package. It's a container that holds your assets. So if you don't send the assets along with the InDesign file, it's pretty useless. So um, the way that it works is when you create an InDesign document, what you see on the screen is just a bunch of links to the photos and images and text and things like that and fonts. So um, sending the InDesign file without packaging it is like sending an empty folder. Um, there's some problems with that, obviously. So InDesign has a built-in tool to allow you to package your document. Just go to File, uh, Package, and it's going to assemble everything, all the disparate images all over your hard drive, graphics, things like that, whatever fonts you've used. It's going to compile those or duplicate them and put them into a folder right alongside the InDesign document. And it's going to generate a file where you can insert uh, instructions and contact information and all those kind of things. So it's efficient and make sure that nothing gets left behind or missed. So understanding how to package your InDesign document is important. Um, I recommend as you're working at some point, just save your document, obviously save, save regularly, but package your document at some point too. And that's going to just make sure that maybe you have pictures in your pictures folder. Maybe you have um, different elements in different places, your illustrator files somewhere else. Make sure that you just package and that's going to pull it all into one place and make sure you don't end up missing something that's critical. Um, the reason InDesign does this is, uh, it seems like it's kind of complicated, but it really is a necess necessity. If you imagine, let's say you're doing a 300 page um, recipe book with tons of high resolution photos. Um, all those pages, all those images, that's just going to eat up your memory, your RAM. You're not going to be able to open and work with that file at all. So InDesign, the way it works, it's going to just show you a little preview of the document. When you export out the PDF, then it's going to take all those assets, all those high res photos, and it's going to embed them in the PDF. So the PDF will be really big, but your InDesign file is just a bunch of thumbnails. It's not going to be a huge, gigantic document that's uh, impossible to work with. So that's it. Just remember those, those key things there, um, spot colors, bleed, packaging, exporting, um, and you'll be in good shape.